and welcome back. It's now two minutes after seven o'clock, and I promised before the break, we're sitting down to talk about the World Bank's Doing Business Report for 2019. And joining us for this conversation, we have the Executive Director from the Economic Development Council, Ishmael Kuras, and we also have the Private Sector Co-Chair of the EDC, Kay Menses. Good morning, Good morning and welcome to the show. Thank Good you morning, very much. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Belize. Thanks for having us. Let's start off just by talking a little bit about the uh, EDC. What does it do? Because um, people may not understand uh, the scope of the work and also the objective of uh, the um, council. Great. So if I may, the EDC, or Economic Development Council, is an advisory body, public-private sector um, composed. Uh, and the objective is to advise the Prime Minister and government on very important um, policy reforms that need to be moved along um, into in order to improve the business climate in Belize. The idea is to facilitate business um, and by developing a, a better mutual understanding between public and private sector, the idea is to find that um, middle ground to identify challenges that need to be addressed and possible solutions for moving them forward, right? So improving just the way that business operates. How does it plug into uh, the government and also into the private sector? Well, it's uh, the, the, the leading body of it, the council itself, is composed of half private sector and half public sector representing key sectors. So, for example, on the private sector side, you have um, export, you have banking, you have agriculture, you have tourism. These are all very, very important to, to our economy. And on the public sector side, you have as much as possible counterparts. So you have the CEO for agriculture is, is present there. The um, financial secretary sits there, as, as well as the CEO from the office of the prime minister and um, the CEO for economic development. We have, and, and the fifth one is the CEO for ministry of investment. We have um, sort of a collaborative approach, a consensus approach, where uh, the notion of, let's say something comes up that we say, as, as we're about to talk about, um, this, th there are hurdles to proceeding forward with the economy growing as fast as we need to grow. So we identify those hurdles, discuss approaches to, to clearing out the hurdles, come to a point of agreement, because public sector and private sector look, to, look at things very differently, but at the end of the day, everybody around the table understands that there is one, one goal in mind, and that is Belize's development. So looking at the common goal, coming from diverse angles, the idea is to reach a consensus as to the way forward on whatever issue we discuss and make that recommendation through the prime minister. What happens once that recommendation is made? How do you get teeth into <laughs> what you've uh, recommended as the EDC? So beyond the advisory body, which is the, the upper level of the, the EDC uh, mechanism, there is a technical unit, and that's the public-private desk in the office of the Prime Minister. We provide um, project management support to respective line ministries in their deliverance of improvements, of reforms, of different projects and initiatives that they're uh, introducing or undertaking with the objective of improving the, s the public service that they deliver. Um, it resides within the office of the Prime Minister to have that convening power to bring, uh, to bring out the people who need um, the decision makers, right, who are authorized to make decisions within the government, um, and to, of course, link to the private sector. So it's there to provide support and to make things move along and happen. When you think public-private, for some reason or the other, there's a sense that perhaps there's a bucking of heads, so to speak. <laughs> I know you mentioned that the government and the, or the public sector looks at things quite differently than the way you guys would in the business community. In terms of finding that middle ground or that, that sort of harmony, what has that been like in terms of um, either facing some of the challenges in terms of difference of, of approach and what have you? If I could just give one example <coughs> of, of, of a reform that has been uh, in the works, uh, that has been advanced quite a lot, and that's the issue of trade license reform. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that the private sector has consistently had complaints about for its subjectivity, its unpredictability, um, and uh, just the, the general non-standard way in which it's applied. Um, 
From the public sector side, there is the understanding that it needs to be improved. However, we also have to make sure that the, 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 the government's, um, what's important to the government, in this case, revenue for the municipalities isn't negatively affected. And so by doing different iterations, different modelings, different running the data, finding out what could work to adjust, but at the same time not negatively impact the way that the government uh, is able to, to continue to deliver service. Um, that's how it works. It's, it's, a, it's a constant dialogue, it's a constant discussion, it's looking at data, mm -hmm. um, which is something that's very important you know, for us moving forward, that we use data to make decisions. Yeah, it's a key to it. Um, one of the issues for us is that it's a, the, in, in the area where I sit, it's free dialogue. Mm -hmm. So if I have a concern, that is the space to bring it up. If um, I feel that something makes no sense or can't be accomplished, that is the space to bring it up. And a lot of the time it allows for much more airing of, of issues in surrounding whatever topic we're discussing than you would realize. And at the end of it, what we feel like is by the time we generate a document to go forward, um, we have considered just about as much as we can consider uh, in terms of how to, how to solve whatever problem is in front of us, for example, the trade licensing. Um, but in that room, the main challenge for us in the early stages of the EDC's existence was to come to a common understanding that neither side was a threat to the other. Mm -hmm. um, having done that, everybody in that room tends to speak very freely and tends to come to the conclusion, rather than being obstructionist, come to the conclusion that we are here to solve a problem, let's figure out how we solve that problem. And it, it overcomes a lot of differences when you take that approach. The economy is very broad. Um, how do you uh, focus in on particular issues? Is it uh, something uh, where the noisy wheel gets uh, the oil? <laughs> or how uh, are issues placed on the table um, and become important enough um, to warrant action? The, the way that the EDC started out was because some issues were glaring. Mm -hmm. Those are the issues that were the first to be tackled. And among those issues was, as Ishmael mentioned, trade license, there's tax reform, and there's um, transportation reform. And I'll give you an example of how transportation reform uh, evolved. First of all, the Doing Business report mentioned that um, in terms of the complete transit experience for import and export goods, we tended to be about twice the regional average in cost. And we said, well, we have to address this. We have to look at the ports, what's going on, and so on. And we proceeded to discuss studying um, the ports. What are the options? What are the opportunities there? And so on. And then one of the members of the EDC around the table, public sector member, said, but hang on a second. You need to get goods to the ports. And when we, when we discussed it all, we realized we needed a holistic approach to the transportation system, which means that if you look at our mass transportation of people, definitely there's help needed there. If you look at the mass transit of goods, there's help needed there. We move people by air, by land, by sea in this country, and we move people inside and outside the borders, through the borders. So we ended up realizing that to, to solve the problem of the ports, we had to look at a broader issue, and that was because the, the discussion went that way. As a result, we have the master transportation, uh, sorry, the transportation master plan, which resulted, which segments and organizes the approach to reforming transportation. And we've taken a similar approach to tax reform. Now, to answer your question, William, it, in a way, it's, it's the loudest noise, but it's also the broadest issues that get approached first. For example, tax reform, when the, when the EDC did a survey of the private sector, everybody complained about the structure of taxation, the levels of taxation, the complexities of taxation. So tax reform became the other priority, not the higher or lower, but the other priority. Um, and so the approaches come from, this will have the broadest impact. Transportation will impact everybody. Tax reform will impact everybody. And once we solve those, then the other problems rise to the top. And that's kind of how the approach is taken. Now, when you look at these reports, I know there's also an open for business uh, report that the US Embassy does. How do these reports actually uh, impact us? Because 
you know, for a lot of people who may not have heard <laughs> of uh, the World Bank's uh, do doing business report, mm. um, you know, it comes up, it's, uh, it's almost seen as an external view of what happens in the country. Mm -hmm. But why should Belizeans be concerned or uh, tune in to these types of reports? The simplest answer, how easy is it to do business in this country? That's what these reports measure. If, it, if I have to walk in and I have to pay, to get the head, get, pay extra to get to the head of a line, or I have to wait a year to get a piece of paperwork for a process that should take a week or maybe a day, then I have a problem. These reports basically measure how easy and how simple it is to do business in this country. And there's always room for improvement. Each and every country on that index thinks so. And if I could add, one of the reasons why we're very happy to be here talking about this report is that it's very important for every single Belizean to realize that the economy affects them. Economic activity, business activity affects them th whichever way you look at it, uh, through employment, through profit generation, through, through all of that. Um, and so it's important for people to understand that where there are obstacles and frustrations to conducting your business, let's actually deal with that. You know, let's deal with it, demand I um, improved quality of services, um, as well as work to embrace the change that needs to happen. But is the facilitation of business, mm -hmm. a lot of people might look at it as an external, you're looking at mm -hmm. how foreigners nope. come in and uh, are allowed to do business, the ease of it. Mm. Because a lot of Belizeans might argue, well, for me, it's strings. It's mm -hmm. how, who I know, where, when, how things move. And I don't have a system to actually uh, maneuver this, the, the bigger system mm. unless I know somebody or I can go there and spend countless hours just waiting and being patient. Precisely. And, and, and that's the thing. If, if we want to start businesses and get businesses, an economy doesn't get going if you don't have an easy way to start businesses because if you start five businesses, two might succeed. If you start 10 businesses, three or four might succeed. You have to be able to start businesses, run businesses, move them on and allow them to grow as well or the economy doesn't grow. And that's what we're seeing right now. You have a, a level or somewhat shrinking economy compared to population growth. Um, if we're gonna change that tide, Part of it is if I wake up in the morning and I decide I have a business idea, I should be able to act on it and move forward by late today or let's say at, outside, at the outside later in the week. Um, if I wake up and I find out that I have a great business idea but I have to fill out this paperwork, go to this city, come back to this next city for this other paperwork, um, apply for this here, see if I get that there, wait till somebody meets here to get that piece there. By the time I go to bed that evening, I'm thinking about something else, not the business idea anymore. So how do we grow? We encourage each other to grow by making it easy to do so. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not th nothing to do with foreign or local, that's everybody. In fact, yeah. I think Ishmael should explain how the Doing Business Index comes about, who's ser what, what the, the scenario business is in it, and it, it doesn't focus on foreigners at all. Correct. I think fundamentally it begins on the, the, the experience of the Belizean entrepreneur, the Belizean businesses, and therefore the, the importance of improving the system for them, you know, for, for, for everybody, right? In the, in the uh, spin-off, we then get to attract in foreign investment, but I think the, the basis of it is improving the way that it works for Belizeans. Um, the way that the data is collected is that uh, surveys are conducted um, mapping uh, where local businesses um, get to voice their uh, or confirm and validate their experiences in trying to open a business, in accessing electricity, in getting credit, in different along the lines of the indicators um, that the World Bank, uh, Bank tracks. So it's, it's data directly from the Belizean um, businesses that how is feed easy, this. How easy or how direct is this kind of facilitation for any uh, business person or a potential entrepreneur? Facilitation in the sense of, <coughs> excuse me, in the sense of, you know, you want to be able to, to start a business or expand a business and you're looking for, um, you have an idea, proposal mm -hmm. or what have you, but you need to go through all of these respective, uh, help me here. The processes. Processes, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. How easy or, or direct is that kind of facilitation? I think it depends on the different agencies that deliver the public services, the respective mm -hmm. public services. Um, and therein lies where, you know, where 
we were able to identify where we're not performing up to standard by having excessive steps, procedures, time, cost um, for, you know, for, for a specific thing like um, registering a business name. Mm -hmm. um, and then knowing that that responsible entity or the entity responsible for that service is then able to improve and facilitate where, where they deliver or how they deliver the services. So it's different across the spectrum of the different public services. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to note where we're not performing you know, better, but also be aware of the innovations that we can incorporate to deliver services um, to have people be, be able, better able to conduct business. This is another thing that the EDC is pushing for is e-government. Mm -hmm. The idea that William wakes up in the morning and decides he wants to start a business and he simply goes online, makes the relevant applications and by evening he has a certificate ready to go because the system has evaluated him according to very fixed mm -hmm. um, as opposed to well, I know you, and, and Isani says, yeah, yeah, William Street, and then um, Ishmael comes along and says, well, yeah, but will, um, William may upset me in a high school once, so I know mm -hmm. the bother with he. Um, you know, we, we need to move on to, to faster, more efficient, more l um, systems with less discri discrimination in them, mm -hmm. and that allows the economy to move faster as well. Um, a lot of what we're doing right now is, it's antiquated, it's discretionary, and it lends to red tape that really has no place in today's business world. And before we jump in, because <coughs> of what you said just now, the discretion, mm -hmm. many of our laws are written with a minister having mm -hmm. that discretion. So you're also talking about legal um, um, legislative uh, reforms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a part of what the EDC does and does reports such as this actually push government to take away the discretion from ministers? And how do you get cabinet to buy into that? <laughs> I yeah. wish it did. Um, it's not a mandate of the EDC to remove that phrase from every piece of legislation. It is a mandate of the EDC to try and make business more efficient. If you stumble across a piece of legislation that is in the way of things being efficient, then, then we address that. And we have addressed that um, in a couple of pieces of, of legislation mm -hmm. as we've gone along. Um, I think trade license, when it comes yes. out, will, will have some effect. But um, I agree with you. I think the purpose of law is to be fixed and not discretionary. And I'm no lawyer, but I mean, from my point of view, if I'm planning ahead as a business and I want to predict what my, what my abilities will be, my capabilities, my protection in under the law, I want to know that that is fixed protection, not that some minister somewhere along the line can come, uh, come along and, and wipe it away somehow. One of the ways that um, the, 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 the point or the problem of discretion can be addressed is through delivering e-services, e, e you know, e-government um, services. So when you have to submit an application via online platform where the information is generally just fed through the system and it's taken to the next step once the previous criteria has been met, it facilitates and it takes away that, um, you know, the, the, the eyes looking at specific names, for example. Um, so that's one way in which it's meant to improve and improve the efficiency in that regard. We've been having this discussion of e-governance for quite some time mm -hmm. across uh, various areas or subjects. How realistic or how practical is this change at this point in time? Is it something that we can look forward to within a reasonable time or is it still far ahead of us? So we're very excited um, that our office is actually implementing a digitization project. It's being funded by uh, the Compete Caribbean facility of the IDB. Um, and this is meant to re-engineer the business services of at least two um, public, uh, pub public sector entities that deliver services to, to, to the business community. That um, speaks to, it, it, we haven't decided on which two of those services um, are going to be targeted as yet. But the idea is to, in a very holistic way, looking at the legislative uh, and policy through to the user interface level to develop a service uh, or to deliver a service um, online. That is meant to serve as a template for replicating other e-government initiatives that, that then complements the government's overall e-government strategy. Um, so this project um, is contributing to building the country's experience to deliver digital services in at least two public sector services as a pilot um, within the next 15 months, right? So this is something that's real, it's on the ground right now. Um, we're learning as we go along, and the idea is to really gain support, not only from the entities that deliver the services, but from the public as well, because they will also have to embrace change. 
they will also have to be open to the idea of working from their phone to send an mm -hmm. application. Um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done there as well. How much uh, political will is there for this? Because very often we know too that uh, something new is implemented that is supposed to make it more efficient mm -hmm. and there's an outcry on the talk show circuit and Im immediately because of the political mm. um, you know, um, damage that may result, you have a rolling back of that kind of, okay, it's good, but let's see how we'll do it. So is there political will and stick it to itness, if such a word exists, <laughs> <laughs> to actually you know, see these things through and not yeah. pick the pieces yeah. that are more politically expedient? Political will or securing political will is always a challenge. Um, but on the point of digitization and delivering ser public services via online platforms, it seems that the government is backing this very, very much. They, they want the, the change to happen because from the administrative side, it also improves government's ability to use its resources in, in smarter ways and to have cost savings. Uh, and so it does make sense um, all around and, you know, on the point of digitization, at least um, you know, as a trial pilot phase, the government is interested in making it successful. For the broader picture, I would tend to say that um, for, the, for, for the audience here listening today and I, uh, everybody else out there, that political will is created by the people. Um, if you want it and you tell your area rep you want it or else, then it happens. Um, the idea there being what can be so wrong about um, apply, being able to pay your, la your property taxes online, being able to apply for your piece of land online, being able to apply for your passport electronically, um, being able to, to apply for starting your business, registering your business name, um, getting your, your trade license sorted, all of this at the click of a few buttons. Um, if, if you decide that you want to do things more easily than line up in, in vital stats for days on end, mm -hmm then tell your area rep that and that's creating the political will. The, the issue being that I don't see anybody wanting to take the long way in all of this and right now we're, we're under systems that call for you to take the long way. Any of us need a piece of paper for anything, we kind of dread having to go through the process, don't we? Or else, like William says, we're lucky enough to know somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not how it's supposed to be because what happens when you don't know somebody? What happens when you have to get in that line? What happens when somebody steps in line ahead of you? No man, if you can, all do, the, if you can do this all electronically, why not go for it? Tell your, rep, your elected representative, this is what I wanna see. That's how political will is created. Now, let's get into um, the report itself because there might not be clarity as to what are the, you know, the goals or objectives that it, it actually measures. Um, was there a benchmarking and you know, when you have a 125 ranking and you say, oh, we fell a little, you know, some people immediately can't be good if you fell, <laughs> you know. So how do you interpret the results of the report itself? So, they, they, you know, the World Bank's doing business report has its criticisms and it does have some limitations. The inconsistency, at least in the past, um, prior to the last two years, in the way, in the indicators that were actually being measured resulted in countries' ranks fluctuating, right? Without necessarily them performing poorly, you know, internally to themselves. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. Um, however, what we have noticed is that Belize's ranking has fluctuated over the past. We've done well in some regard and in some other areas, in some other indicators, we've not, we've fallen. Um, the idea is not to criticize, the idea is to actually use the information that is collected about Belize um, to say, and comparing with other countries, to say that actually I think we can improve in this area. You know, let's look at you know, the process for applying for electricity, for example, um, which is an area that we slipped significantly in this year's um, doing business report. Uh, and do something about it, right? The other thing to bear in mind is that there are reforms in motion, there are reforms already completed, but perhaps not captured by this doing business report because what, what those improvements speak to fall outside the scope of the indicator. That's something that's very important for people to understand in general, that this looks at very specific um, measurements, you know, time it takes to, for, for, for an application to be processed, 
cost, steps, uh, things like that. And if we do other improvements, and other improvements are happening, but they don't necessarily match what the indicators are looking for, then our progress won't be indicated, won't be reflected in, in, in the report itself. I also would add to that that um, a, a lot of the way the survey is done, the improvements have to be felt on the ground by the businesses they're surveying. So if you're surveying the private sector and you've done an improvement and it hasn't filtered down, they say, well, I don't know, it's no easier for me to start a business than it was last year. And there's your score. So basically what has to be done has to be done well enough that it does get felt at, at the bottom of the process. It's all very well to say you did it, but um, at the end, the beneficiary has to benefit for it to really be um, added to the score. So let's look at the indicators that we did not so well at, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back to the ones that we did better at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, you know, Two of the indicators that we didn't do very well in are getting electricity. We lost eight points there. When you say getting electricity. Applying for your electric electricity connection, mm -hmm. right? Um, on the ground, we know that Belize Electricity Limited has been doing some work to improve the way that they deliver the services to the public um, in reducing the time and the cost that it takes to connect, you know, to, to form all ele the, the, the electrical grid. Um, that those improvements have happened over the past year, you know, and as a result, they might not be reflected in, in this report. But it's looking at how long it takes, you know, the cost, um, because we know that a significant complaint from the public has been the cost and the time it takes and the inefficiencies for applying. Um, we hear that there are improvements. Um, it is likely that those improvements will be reflected in subsequent reports. Right. Right. What is the other one? Another area is dealing with construction permits, and this is something that um, you know has has been in the news quite a bit. You know, it, the, 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 the the issue of the central building authority, their jurisdiction versus the now what are now building units, and one of the this is actually one of the reforms that the EDC and its technical secretariat were able to provide support to the Ministry of Housing on, in first of all amending the Belize Building Act to clarify the jurisdictions of what CBA is responsible for versus what the local building, uh, building units um, are responsible for, and putting in place key definitions um, for what is a, a shed, for example, and does it require a building permit. Um, that has now been handed back to the Ministry of Housing. They have made some improvements, and the, 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 the reform continues to be implemented, um, but it's felt on the ground as, as Kay mentioned, that the process is no, n not much improved because of whatever challenge that person who was interviewed um, experienced. So it really does need to translate into, you know, standardized experience that is of high quality on the ground for it to you be You get the impression that since this is an annual report or an annual exercise being done, and you look at, for instance, those two points that you raised just now in terms of um, access to electricity and construction. Do you think that, okay, if you're at a certain point or a certain level <clears throat> and then you backslide somewhat, I think it's a little bit more difficult to be able to make progress thereafter. Do you believe that within a year, by the time the 2020 report comes around for argument's sake, that there would have been a turnaround or an improvement on that end regarding electricity and construction? If there is effective communication mm -hmm. between public and private sector as to what the process actually entails, mm -hmm. and if there is actual improvement in the delivery of the service, yes, you know that can be reflected very, very quickly, um, but it does have to be felt by the people on the ground. And two that we did better at? Two that we did better at? Hmm. Searches. <laughs> <laughs> Searching. Um, two that we did not um, fall all that badly on are starting a business. We only lost one point there. Um, we know that there have been some improvements um, at the, the company's registry. Um, and where else? Enforcing, en enforcing contracts. contracts. Enforcing contracts. You know, not, not sure exactly where that 
kind of well, we still have a word of mouth culture, right? Yeah. <laughs> Enfor enforcing contracts would be about legal predictability, and businesses need that. They need to know that if if they're you know entering into a contract, that there will be a way to resolve it should it go wrong mm -hmm. in court. So enforcing contracts is kind of important for businesses starting out. I looked at the indicators, and one of the ones that jumped out at me was uh, getting capital. Mm -hmm. how, how are we doing with that? Because um, whether it's agro-credit or any other type of credit, that still tends to be extremely expensive and difficult. Um, how are we doing at that? Ooh. What's your score? <laughs> <laughs> getting credit. Getting credit is, we dropped by two points. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think the banking sector tends to be conservative. And when you deal with agri agriculture and, and that sort of, wh when you're dealing with agriculture primarily, it is seen as a high risk um, uh, line of business. So there we have to improve um, farmers' access to credit uh, in terms of not, uh, you mentioned not just the availability, but the cost. But somehow in this world of climate change and so on, we have to find a way to tackle it outside of just the bear going to the bank and trying to get a lower interest loan. We have to find new mechanisms for that, um, which is a work in process, hopefully. And there's also the point of uh, the collateral that's required um, for mm -hmm. accessing credit. Uh, and you know the discussion has been ongoing um, for a credit bureau, um, as well as a the secure transactions and collateral registry. We know that those have recently been, um, you know, I interest has been resurrected in them and in delivery, including that in the, in, the, in, this, in the landscape of the financial sector. Uh, and so it is hoped that once we work on those, we make them happen, we, we, we ensure that they're established, it adds that um, additional tool that people can use, mm -hmm. especially small or medium enterprises, for using uh, things other than land for their, you know, f to access credit. Interest rates? Interest rates. <laughs> yeah, it's controlled by, by others than us. Um, <laughs> no, the, the, the issue there is that for small business or new business or young people starting out in business, you don't have a record. So immediately your interest rate is higher if you can even get a loan. Mm -hmm. You start off hopefully being able to borrow from family or something like that and you go to the banks and they go, who are you? So um, they, they, we have to find other mechanisms. As Ishmael mentioned, the Secured Transactions Registry and the Credit Bureau are essential because with a credit bureau, you're able to establish a good credit rating that somebody doesn't have to know William Neal to know that he has a good credit rating. Um, and Isani Cayetano doesn't have to own a piece of land to get a loan. So um, if we can get those mechanisms moving, that's a big step forward for small business. But also, I think we have to take a more entrepreneurial approach in, in the private sector to finding ways of exchanging capital that don't necessarily all involve um, the traditional banking methods, no? Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it, cash has to flow. When you look at the doing business report, I think perhaps a, a part of the challenge lies in the name itself, mm -hmm. right? Because most people feel as if though if I'm not doing business, they're thinking of trying to establish a business, trying mm -hmm. to run a business. Mm -hmm. So I still want it to come down to have people understand why these reports are actually important for them to even pay attention to. Um, not just the ranking, but what it means on the ground. Because I like the fact that you said if uh, the beneficiaries are not benefiting mm -hmm. from whatever changes, then it's just, you know, uh, to know, um, you know, benefit to anyone. If I could just begin by saying that around the world, um, the, the Doing Business Report has, has stimulated um, competitivity across countries, you know, them wanting to outperform the other. Um, and at the, the national level, it's important that we are discussing this report because we begin to participate in the, in the, in the discussion around what needs to change, right? The person, the beneficiary, the small business owner needs to have a voice. They need to be able to contribute and say, actually, this is a problem for me. You know, this is making my business fail. Um, and so therefore, let's address it. You know? And so becoming more aware, more active in the discussion across the board is, is critical and hence the importance of reports mm -hmm. like this. I think one of the, the aspects is um, 
when you went to school, you didn't know how you were doing in school without a report card, without test mm. results, without mm. these things. So it's an imperfect measure, but it's a measure. And it shows us generally how the country is doing. Is it getting better? Is it getting harder to do business and so on? This, of course, then informs decision making elsewhere, not just here. But the idea being that if we take this from the competitive perspective and say, all right, we're going to climb up that scale. It's not just what you score, it's how you climb that matters. So if Belize, having dropped so many levels in, in the last few years, if Belize all of a sudden turns around and starts to go back up and next year is up at 112 or one, you know, one, uh, we're at 125 now, so we go back up to 118 or something, somebody says, wow, work is happening on the ground. And it in business confidence, for if people think that there is improvement, mm -hmm. I tackle it, I look at it again, and I say, well, let me work in this economy because they're working to improve. So it's not just about getting an A scoring it. It isn't about being number one. It's about showing that you're interested in improving. And that's, that's what matters most when you're looking at that report, both from the private sector perspective, continuing to look at the report and seeing where things are lacking and, and putting in your two cents, but also from the public sector perspective, this report shows whether or not government is providing an enabling environment to allow business to do business. That's the, the simplest summary of what that report is. So if individuals within government look at it and say, all right, where can we do better? Hang on, I can change that process. And all of a sudden, we start to climb back up. That's what we want to say. How do businesses actually feed into what happens at the EDC? Because I think that's perhaps do you have to belong to uh, BCCI or something like that for you to actually feed into this process? Um, so the Chamber of Commerce does have representation on the EDC. Uh, and as we know, the Chamber has a broad um, coverage of the business sector. Uh, and so a good, you know, a, a, you know, a good element or, or content of what the general business sector is feeling does get channeled through the, the Chamber's input. However, you can very easily access um, us at the, at the EDC, uh, to, at the, at the public-private desk, to voice your concern, your opinion. We take note of it, and we raise it at our debates, at our discussions, to identify what's possible for moving it along. It may not require legislative reform. It might require communication, right? Within, within a ministry to say, actually, why is this process happening like this, you know? What can we do to improve it? And sometimes it's, it's just clarification that's needed. Right? You, you talk about the open dialogue as one of the hallmarks mm -hmm. of the council, um, or the, uh, yeah, the council. How do you get the broader public engaged to make that kind of, because obviously if I can make a presentation to the EDC, then you'll have, I, I have your attention, pretty mm -hmm. much. But how do you get people or communities to actually discuss some of these things that they may see as an issue and feed into what the EDC is doing? In the past um, few years, there, uh, the primary forum has been at the Prime Minister's Business Forum, where the public and the private sector is able to voice their, their opinions and concerns. Um, and so in the absence of that, you know, we are able to receive um, comments directly from, from the community, from, from the private uh, sector. Additionally, um, I believe Ishmael and his team are getting ready to launch a communication um, platform. Mm -hmm. um, we have a website yes. and other methods of contact as well. You can, you can make a call, as he mentioned, or send in an email or um, communicate in all the new traditional ways. But um, the point is to do communicate do communicate because if the more the EDC is aware of, of what's happening out there, the better it is. Um, other organizations, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the start, that are represented are um, agriculture, tourism, uh, banking, and uh, export. And between everybody that's sitting there, there is a broad interest. It's not everybody comes there from a particular representation, but they come with a broad interest in just getting better business done. So um, at the end of that, speak to any members of, of the EDC that you know, like William said, we all know everybody. Um, but the idea is not to keep silent and just simmer. The idea is to, to 
give your feedback. Speak through the, the, the BTIA, you know, the Belize Hotels Association, the uh, Belize Agroproductive Group. They're all represented. The Livestock in this. Association as well. Correct. Yeah. So just voice it and then it channels back up. What happens now, before, before we wrap, but what happens now with the report? How does that inform the action of the EDC? So we've recently developed a strategic plan for the, the EDC um, in terms of the, our focal areas, right? We're going to be looking at what the report says in terms of where we've not performed well and seeing how that fits in to our strategic plan, updating it, and then channeling the efforts and the resources to making that communication, that dialogue um, proceed in actively looking for solutions uh, and improvements. All right. The work Any continues. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sitting down and having this conversation with us today. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, we'll be to look at growing the Belize film industry through animation. Don't go anywhere. Open your eyes. Continues after these messages.